No bacteria has affected human history as significantly as the Yersinia pestis. So let's uh, take the example of this classroom. There's 27 students in here today. Uh, with a death rate of one third more, or with a one third mortality rate, that means the entire front row of students is dead if we're afflicted by this disease. Uh, so if anyone knows what this is, uh, Yersinia pestis is the bacteria that causes the bubonic plague, also known as pesti or just the plague. Uh, it's forever notorious, it's marred human history, it's haunted human civilization for millennia, uh, and it's still endemic to certain areas of the world, and it's still in the United States, uh, still very active today, just not in the pandemic sense as it was in antiquity. Uh, it's a member of the family Enterobacteriaceae, it's a facultative anaerobe, gram-negative, ovoid bacillus, non-motile, and capsulated. Uh, it's a very interesting bacteria in its method of transmission. Uh, but I'll get to that in a second. You can identify the uh, Yersinia pestis by its unique paperclip uh, shaped stain and a bipolar stain. The reason for this is the uh, double membrane. You see a very clear paperclip shape here. And it grows best at 28 degrees Celsius. Uh, there's, what really makes this bacteria interesting in terms of its infectivity uh, is that it inhibits phagocytosis. By, there's a couple antibody or an antigens that it secretes, and they're secreted only at human body temperature. So uh, I'll get into why this bacteria was so interesting to me. Um, it's very difficult for a pathogen to successfully attack a host because it has to overcome the immune system of that host. This bacteria not only, I guess I'll go to the next step, slide, it's not only transmit, or it's not only found in humans, it's found in over 200 hosts of mammals. It just incidentally infects humans. Uh, the main host is, is rats or mice or rodents. Um, but it's also adapted, and the way it gets around is through Xenocylate Cheopsis and also 80 other species of fleas. Um, so it, it not only has invertebrate adaptation, it can infect invertebrates, and that's where its main life cycle is, the zoonotic cycle. There's an epizoonotic cycle into humans and into two other types of mammals. So it's a very adaptive organism that it can infect invertebrates and vertebrates both. Um, it was discovered uh, by a French and Swiss physician named Alexandre Yersin in uh, 1894, there was a huge outbreak of bubonic plague in Hong Kong, and actually that spread, in, that uh, pandemic ended up going worldwide. Rats found on shipping, on shipping boats from China spread throughout the world, carried the fleas, and we had uh, massive deaths from that. Oh, to go back, um, so yeah, there, there's the zoonotic cycle where it, go, it stays inside of rodent populations, so in the United States, in the wild, there's still rodents that carry uh, bubonic plague, and it actually has a, non, a less fatal rate in rodents as it kind of has this culture that exists in the rodent populations. Um, and then if a human gets bit by a flea, this is the most common, 80% of bubonic plague cases are spread by this. It's a flea bite. Um, the, term, the, the term bubo, or bubonic plague, is an enlarged lymph node. The virus goes direct, or the, the bacteria uh, settles in, lymph in the lymphatic system. It's forming bubos, which is these big, boil-looking growths. And then uh, as, the, as the bacteria progresses through the body, uh, you can get airborne, airborne transmission as it infects the, um, the lung tissue, the mucosa. Uh, as you cough, someone else can breathe that in. So this is the only form of human-to-human -human transmission is by airborne route or droplet. And then uh, there's a zoonotic vector as well. Uh, so the symptoms of this is you have a sudden onset of high fever, uh, the large lymph nodes, the buboes I mentioned earlier. Uh, you have skin hemorrhages and these big dark uh, patches form under the skin, given at the term the black death which is what it was named after in Europe. Uh, and eventually you can have gangrene of limbs, um, and of course you have a severe cough, bloody and frothy sputum, uh, in the case of the lung infection, the pneumonic plague. Uh, this is an image courtesy of uh, Ken Gage, doctor of uh, philosophy at the, at the CDC. Uh, it's just a rat coughing up blood. Bubonic plague, pneumonic plague. So the, the plague has three forms. There's bubonic, which is the lymphatic, forming the buboes spread by the fleas. Uh, if untreated, you have a 50% fatality rate which is why the death rate is so high uh, in, in Europe. And as, if this continues, you have septicemic plague, uh, systemic infection where it spreads throughout your blood and through the meninges into the brain, uh, hypotension, uh, it's a pretty bad way to die. It's, it's basically hypotensive shock, um, and it's fatal. If, if your disease progresses to septicemic shock, shock, there's no way we can bring you back to your toes. Um, and then pneumonic plague is in the lung tissue. You can spread, this is how it's spread human to human. Um, I got some kind of note here that I'm going to say right now. Oh, uh, 
Septicemic plague also manifests in hepatosplenomegaly, which is a cool word, meaning that the liver and spleen become grossly inflamed and covered in abscesses, which burst inside of your abdomen. That's a great way to die. Um, okay, so it's a horrible disease. Let's talk about uh, some cases. Cats actually spread bubonic plague. Uh, they're, they're extremely susceptible to bubonic plague. I hate cats. And uh, Paul Gaylord was infected in June when he tried to remove a mouse from the throat of a choking cat. He should have let the cat die. Instead, he got stricken by bubonic plague in his, in his hands and toes, and they had to be removed. This poor guy, bubonic plague. And this, has happened pretty, this is from the, like, an article in 2012 on the Daily Mail. He looks like a pretty not happy guy. Uh, and so in antiquity, like we know the Black Death is kind of a famous thing. This is a plague doctor. Uh, this is the, the people that went around and treated Black Plague. Uh, the reason why this uniform was worn, interesting enough, they wore it's, they had sweet-smelling herbs and aroma, fragrances in there so they didn't have to smell the rotting flesh. Uh, and the mask also protected them from inhaling the droplets. Uh, this big gown was covered in wax, so it stopped, uh, I don't know, getting fluids on you, and also I guess it stopped flea bites. The fleas wouldn't be able to get through your big robe. And they had a stick so they could poke patients without having to get close. Um, okay, so it was first described in the Old Testament. Uh, the earliest pandemic that we can confirm is the Justinian Plague, which affected the Byzantine Empire. It actually killed about a third of the Byzantine Empire. Um, this is the first case. Like, then the second case, the second huge pandemic, was the Black Death of the Middle Ages. I think everyone's kind of familiar with this. It killed 30 to 50 percent of the population of Europe, depending on where it was. Um, so that's why I'm saying the whole front of the classroom is toast. Um, Oh, and then the modern plague. This is the one I mentioned that uh, the Urson found in the in Hong Kong. He was the one who isolated the bacteria. Uh, it was spread on Chinese steamships, and so 10 million people died of this as it was spread throughout the world. So bubonic plague is still active, but luckily uh, antibiotic therapy, uh, the, the, the birth of antibiotics has really helped us out in terms of suppressing bubonic epidemics or pandemics. Uh, bubonic plague is still around the world. Like I said, it's in the west coast of the United States and wild rodent populations. But we haven't had a human-to-human -human spread in the United States since 1925 in Los Angeles. So it's been a while since we've had an outbreak here. Um, so basically, in order to survive the bubonic plague, uh, avoid contact with wild rodents in the west coast of the United States. If you're a rabbit hunter, for instance, be very careful when you're skinning the rabbit, like wear some kind of protective clothing. Uh, this is actually a bio safety level three containment. It's an infective disease. So uh, you should be wearing some kind of mask, uh, breathing device, suit, you know, heavy-duty gloves. You're wearing some uh, heavy-duty stuff when you're working around this uh, bacterium. Uh, so also rat control, we should keep down on population of rats. Uh, and appropriate antibiotic treatment. It's shown susceptibility to streptomycin, tetracycline, chloramphenicol, and uh, canamycin for neonates. Um, so understandably, like, it's infected uh, populations, or dense populations where there's a lot of humans together in one spot. Uh, rats follow humans, and so a lot of humans together also leads to increased spread. Um, so, yeah, with one third of the population of people that you know today are just gone, you know, one, one out of three people that you know are dead, I think the world would be a very different place. There's actually a theory that I read when I did this project that the amount of people that died uh, during the Black Plague allowed uh, a, uh, there was a labor shortage, so it actually gave rise to the Renaissance, is a theory that I read. That the amount of people that died is a free, more free stuff and more jobs, so. The Renaissance came from the Black Plague. And there you go, I'm Nick Cerrone. <laughs>